a high school graduate, and it reads thus. Dear church family, thank you for the gift card for my graduation. I plan to use it to buy college necessities. I also thank you for the get-together you had to honor me and my achievements. As I go off, I will never forget the church that raised me. When I come home, I will visit all of you and update you on my progress in college. I love all of you, and I am very thankful to have a thoughtful and loving church family. Please keep me in your prayers. Sincerely, Kaylee Johnston. Very nice. When does she head off, uh, Beth? Too well said. Second week in August. So is she going to SPAC at all? Or so she's got still a lot of things going on here before she uh, has to think about uh, heading off up there. I uh, do want to make a couple of uh, well. Before I get to that, let's let's hear any good news you've got. Any anyone got any good stuff going on? Besides, uh, kids are glad schools out, I guess, and all that. Noah, is that true? We haven't gotten report card yet. Okay, so we need to hold off on that good news stuff. Noah, you you want to uh, go back, do some more school, or are you glad to be out? Okay, well, I'll just fessing up. All right, Stancil. I'm alive and well. Stancil is alive and well, yes. But please, if you, uh, if you want to give him encouragement, do not say more power to you. That's one thing he does not want to hear. Well, that was a joke. I mean, come on. Okay. Uh, I guess that's probably all it's worth. I agree. Uh, how did you know? I, that, was, that was Larry's joke. He gave it to me on a little white index card, as a matter of fact. That's, no, okay, that, that's it. There's a story about that, but that, that's a good point. That's a good point. What's that, Beth? I didn't say that, okay? Just let the record show. I did not say what Beth said. Uh, all right, um, are there birthdays we need to be mindful of? Birthdays. Well, that's maybe good news in itself. Who knows? Um, all right, we uh, do have some updates on our prayer list. We have uh, uh, George Farnell, who did have to go to the hospital this week. I'm trying to even see if we have him on our prayer list. I don't think we do. So we need to add George. He hurt his foot in an accident uh, two weeks ago today and uh, was uh, on the men but uh, had an infection issue. So he's in the hospital, should expecting to be out in a couple of days. Um, similarly, Shannon has been ha struggling with shingles, Rick. <laughs> who can tell us about that, uh, and that has been painful, she has said. I hope to never understand that pain. Now that is, is bad. So we'll have Shannon on the prayer list. Um, are there others we need to think of on, for our prayer list? I see no hands, so we will... Uh, take that, take these and add them. Um, Ashley, can you, oh, Rick, yes. I do have one. I just make an announcement that these aren't going to reach out to the test scan. Uh, Wednesday and NSF Health Bank is everything's fine. He's good to go. Good, that is good news. <laughs> that is awesome. Very glad to hear that. And uh, Ashley, can you introduce us to perhaps a couple of new faces to us, anyway? Okay, this is uh, Ross and both of our friends. Ross and Tyler. Okay, you all know who to go say hi to afterwards. All right, I see uh, Hannah now. Hannah, any good news in your life at all? <laughs> Made honor roll. Okay, great. That's awesome. Super. 
And I got some text from Lori. I think she's got an interview. I know that was been a con oh, there she is right there. In interview, right? Interview Monday. Monday, okay. Is it in the Mobile District or, or the Mobile County schools? Okay, that sounds like something I should know about, but I'm afraid I'm not quite sure. But I'll look it up. Google it. Okay, uh, that's all we've got. And, oh, uh, I'm sorry. The, uh, I did make some changes to the written part of the bulletin. And I want to emphasize those. Uh, the special announcements, second item, and third item. So if you, if you find your special announcements and then kind of open up the whole fold, uh, items two and three go on to the next page. A uh, couple of scheduling changes for the summer. Uh, Solid Rock and Sunday School for Kids. We'll still have adult classes, but Sunday School for Kids and Solid Rock are suspended until August 19th for Solid Rock and the next day, August 20th, for our kids' classes. So please take note of that. I believe that's all I've got for the updates in the printed part. Thank you very much. Let's continue with our worship. We welcome you to this service today. We welcome you to the theme of rivers of living water. And we're so glad that Joe is our speaker. We're so glad that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit of living waters and that as we leave, we can go and share. If you will, join with me now in our call to worship. Rushing wind, breath of God, breathe on this congregation. Refresh and renew us. Flaming fire, Holy Spirit, melt us, mold us, and shape us. Purify and transform us. Living water, love of Christ, Fill us, cleanse us, move us to be a river of life for others, flowing into all the world. Let the Spirit breathe on us
Let us pray. Our Father, the God of heaven and earth, we have assembled here this morning to receive your word through your faithful servant. Be with him. Allow his message to be from the spirit of the one we know, Jesus the Christ, our loving Lord. May his peace and grace be with us like the so-called rivers of living water. We thank thee for this opportunity to renew our covenant with thee again, this Lord. Help us to keep this in the forefront of our thinking day by day as we put this trust in Jesus' holy name, always, amen. Let us pray. God of peace, we light this candle to bring us warmth and light. Without the igniting uh, spark, there is no flame. Without the candle's wick, it will not burn. Without the flame, there is no warmth nor light. We ask thee to be the ignified with the Holy Spirit. May we be with the Holy Spirit's spark to burn brightly in a dark world, hungering for your warmth and light. We light this candle to share your love and peace. Amen. Light the candle. I'd like to take the approach this morning by making this comment, and as I've thought many times, and I think Larry and I have talked about it, what do you say differently on a communion day service? Well, I'm going to approach it with your permission this way. About three, four months ago, I was at the Cracker Barrel, which we dearly love, waiting to pay, there was a couple making a, a cash payment, and there was a little girl, maybe two years old, possibly, and all those people waiting to pay, she went around and hugged every person. One of the most humble things I've ever seen. So I knelt down so she could hug my neck, and she did. But the thing that was unique about it was the look on her face. It was genuine. I don't see how Jesus himself could have had a more loving and warm look and look of belief and caring than this little girl did. A sermon quiet. man next to me looked at me and he said, that's great. I said, out of the mouths of babes can come sermons. This little girl never opened a word, but she spoke volumes. I wish you could have seen it, so I'm hoping in your minds that you visualize a little one going throughout all the paying customers and hugging everyone. What a wonderful approach it was. And for the sake of those of you that are keeping up with time on me, I am a smooth 70 now. And thank you, Sheila. <laughs> smooth 70 with a few aches and pains, but we all have those. But I can remember uh, when I was baptized. Do you? Do you remember that day, that night, that evening? Do you remember where it was at? Do you remember the comments made possibly by the speaker? Most likely not. If you do, that's great also. 
Do you remember who baptized you? Do you remember who confirmed you? What a joyful experience it was. And mine was made possible because a number of people in the church at Mobile at that time, Sister Nungesser, some of you know her, some may not. Sister Anna Lavinghouse and Sister Hattie Starr taught the baptismal classes in such a way that you could understand it at that young age. It was so simple yet so truthful. And I can remember those classes as no doubt you do. I can remember the sincerity on their faces, their love of doing it. If anyone was ever ordained, it was those three ladies. They were tremendous. They taught because they believed it. And it made such an impression on me I, when I ran home that day on Baltimore Street in that little shotgun house that we lived in. My grandmother was staying with us, as she did periodically. And I ran into the house and said, Granny, I got to be good. You know, I've been baptized. I was 10. What little I knew then and what little I know now is what it is. But I knew it was the right thing to do because of my mentors in the church, because of people that took time to teach the classes to make it live. We understood what we were doing as best we could. That night, Melvin Miller, Paul Jernig, and myself was baptized. I can remember going in the back part of the old Mobile congregation on that cold floor, changing clothes, but we were all three excited that we were baptized. And we, we knew it was the right thing to do because when the right thing to do, in my opinion, connects with that inherent desire to be redeemed, there's joy. I know a little bit more than I did then, not a lot, but enough to know that it was the right thing to do. Enough to know that that type of an experience in my life has helped me through the years to be able to, to say yes and no, and we use that word temptation or the wrong thing, whatever it might be. I, I can remember numerous situations when confronted that the spirit would kick in, if you please, and remind me, hey, Remember your commitment to me. Remember how important that baptismal service was to you. I was 10, so I've been a member of the church 60 years. I'll never forget that experience and how many times it has helped me through, through the years of my life. When you'd face a whatever, happy moment, sad, but those times when you're challenged to do the right and the wrong thing, if you please. And I remembered that I was confirmed by Brother John Darling and Brother Gomer Miller with Brother Miller as a spokesperson. He was always a very dear friend to me because of that. But these are things that we remember. Do you remember who confirmed you as you go back, as we remember back? Was it special? You bet it was. And I wish we had time to have each one of you share your experience leading up to walking into the water's edge. And we knew because of the, these three ladies and what my mother had taught me that it was the right thing to do. Bless her heart, these ladies forgiving. And as I said before, if anyone was ever ordained to do what they did, they were there. They may not have had the label, but their conviction and their belief in what they were teaching, what they taught all of us kids in those classes was something special. Now, where's Al Star? What are you doing up here? <laughs> you, don't, you don't help a weak heart a bit. Were you baptized that night I was? Do you remember? No, I was baptized two years before that by John Ordain, Darling Jr. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, he gets to heaven two days before I do, hopefully, right? Okay. No, that, that was a special moment. I don't remember the other people, but, but Melvin was, Paul Jernigan, and I remember his late grandfather, brother, or we called him Old Brother Jernigan, respectfully, came by the house where we used to live, and he sat down in the living room on Virginia Street, 
and he talked to mom and dad about being baptized. And I think my brother had missed it, but mama kind of looked at daddy and said, this one will be. And mom got her way, thank goodness. Experiences that happen in life that make communion a special time. And again, I wish we could, all of you could share the times, that special moment in your life. What respectively, whether of younger years, medium or older, it's that moment when you join together the price that Jesus uh, played for each one of us. And I have some familiar select scriptures that I want to share with you. They are re uh, repetitive. I hope that's the word. That I want to share for the purpose of emphasizing the importance of communion. Not to say that you don't know it. But allow me to remind you and me of how important this service is and how important it is when we reach our hands forward. And today, as most of you know, I'm a pretend-like person. So let's pretend like today that Jesus himself is serving the trays. We see the scarred hands, we see the thorns, we see the pierced side, but more importantly, we can look on his face as I did that little girl in Cracker Barrel that day and see peace. And if you haven't had a chance to see the movie, um, the one about Christ, murder of Christ, what's the name of the crucifying Christ? Somebody help me with the name. The, well, not the Passion of Christ, but, but anyway, it showed on um, him being beaten up and hitting the stomach with the fist of his accusers. I'd never seen that approach before. And they hit him and mm, he doubled over just like anyone else would. The physical abuse he took, but he did not waver from his mission. And these scriptures are very special to me and I hope you'll bear with me as I share them with you one more time from Genesis third chapter verses one through three and I the Lord God spake unto Moses saying that Satan whom thou hast commanded in the name of mine only begotten it is the same which was from the beginning and he came before me saying behold send me I will be thy son I will redeem all mankind that one soul shall not be lost and surely I will do it wherefore give me thine honor I wish I could have been there to see, I'm going to say the, the, the wrath or the wrinkle of God's face when these words came forth. That's just me thinking ahead. I, I wish I could have been there. I picture Jesus maybe sitting over in the corner standing with his friends came with these words, but behold my beloved son which was my beloved chosen from the beginning said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. I hope before the hammer drops on me that I'll have a chance to speak to the only begotten because I want to know what he was thinking when all this was going on, as we hear on TV so many times, and Linda knows what I'm going to say. What was going through his mind? Nothing irritates me more than a Sports commentator asking somebody what was going through their mind while the ball was in the air. I want, I want to know what was going through his mind when, it, when this experience took place. For he shall baptize not only with water, but with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Reading from uh, John chapter 28, 29, verse 31. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And John bore record, saying, When he was baptized of me, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him. Late Elder Dan Stacy, if you remember, I shared with you, he suggested, instead of a dove, he suggested the hands of God coming down maybe likened to a dove for the laying on of hands for the, the con confirming moment of that experience. I'm not here to argue that with you either way, but I've got the picture, and Brother Dan made that live, what a wonderful thing it possibly was for the hands of his creator resting on, resting on his only son. 
And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man come unto me except he doeth the will of my Father who hath sent me. I picture this verse as one of a challenge to me and possibly to you, that if the only way that people can get to our creator to God is through Jesus, doesn't that put an awesome, as the kids nowadays and older people say, awesome responsibility of what's expected of us as we, as we see people. I can remember in the old uh, building where we used to, our office was at uh, one St. Louis Center downtown, and I walked up the steps, and there was a man and a woman lightly arguing, and it appeared that they were going to a divorce lawyer. That's what it looked like to me. And instead of taking the time to say, can I, I'm a minister, can I help you? I walked on and got on the elevator and went on up to my office. Sometimes we have only a brief moment in which to inject possibly life, spiritual life-changing words into the lives of individuals. This is a sermon within itself. This is life. I will regret, and I hope I didn't miss something, but possibly I did. And I had a chance once to go to the, in Bailey when the, the big Mooney thing was going on, sat in the classroom around here on two or three Sundays in a row. I talked to one of their representatives, or minister, I guess he was, telling me about what was going on there. He invited me to go and worship with him, and, and I didn't. I wasn't scared to go. I just, for some reason, I didn't go. I regret that in that I wish I had gone, because most likely I would have been the only, may I say, properly, correctly ordained minister amongst all those people. I don't know what kind of spirit I would have carried with me. I don't know what someone's intelligence might have looked at me and said, maybe they see something that they needed. I missed that opportunity, and I do regret that. I hope that I didn't miss someone. If I do, I'll have to take the hit. Being a member of the body of Christ, going into the water, taking this table as a renewal, is our responsibility and promise to be ever alert to those silent indicators so often that people are screaming for help but they're not going to tell you. Going out the back door or right in here, you're not going to come up and tell me most likely where you're hurting and why. But when we get in the homes of the saints, and we do not have to be ordained to do that, when we get in the homes of people and they're going to ask you like they did once when I was making a call, what are you doing here? I said, we're here because we care. Linda and I, after the calling and caring place as an 86, we made some visits. And this girl asked, well, wh why are you here? And I said, we're here because we care about you. With God's guidance, with his help, six months later, her oldest son was baptized. Not because of Joe Brace or Linda, but because we carried a message that they were, that young man was able to latch on to. And it gave him an opportunity to accept possibly or deny Jesus. May not have that but one, one opportunity. I went over to Alberta a number of years ago where we had seized a boat and I had to go down and check on it from time to time. And the young man that was sitting at the bar enjoying his beer, I think, was Bob Wakeman's older son. Larry, I don't remember for sure. He, I think it was him. And I, I, knew it was, I knew it was Bob. And I went on and took care of my assignment, and I thought, I may have missed a lone opportunity, not to preach a sermon to him, but to just to go up and say, hi, guy, Joe Bracewell, I remember your mom and your dad. I missed an opportunity, possibly, to inject words that might have helped turn the situation around, because I know it was him. I know it was him. We get those brief moments, those brief urges, Phone calls, names have come to my mind like I did once with Ruth Burleson. I knew Ruth was having some concerns. I'm out mowing the yard, her name came to mind. I turned the mower off, went inside. I said, I've been thinking about you. She, she said, I've got things on my mind. And she opened up to me. Those brief moments of ministry. If we're looking for the gigantic thing like these televangelists do on TV, and you're going to hear me say many times, I am not a televangelist fan, forgive me. That's by my critical opinion, where they try and get all the money in to do the Lord's work. Only if you plant that seed, God does not take MasterCard, Visa, 
any of them that I'm aware of. It's those brief moments of opportunity when we take time to walk through the mall and we see a face that seems worried. We were in, uh, I call it the OK Corral. Where's that, Linda? The, what? Golden Corral. I call it the OK Corral. <laughs> I call it the OK Corral. We love it. Great food, by the way. They're not paying me to say this, but I eat carefully. I eat less careful amounts. Man, that's nice. That, the little cup of coffee and this piece of little strawberry curd cake with just light sweet on it. And the key thing to eating sweets is to eat it slow. If you eat it fast, you gain weight. If you eat it slow, show dignity to calories, it works. But there was a uh, black lady that had become disoriented. And she, just, you could tell, said something ain't right. So I got up and went back, knelt down by her chair. I said, ma'am, I'm a minister. Is there anything I can do to help you? And she looked at me. She never said a word. But the fact that I and others that were holding her hand took the time to care about a person, regardless of race, creed, or color. And she didn't like 911 being called very independent. She was fighting back. But you don't know what the opportunity is unless you take it. I knelt down, I offered the opportunity to bring what ministry I could. And one of the waitresses there said, I didn't know you were a minister. I said, sometimes, but every when we go in there, you can tell that she looks. Possibly a seed has been planted that will benefit her, hopefully so. I think about Jesus facing the awesome, there's that word again those kids use today, awesome responsibility of what lay ahead of him. And in the book, The Life and Ministry of Jesus, Brother F. Henry Edwards, in one of his chapters, in his opinion, and I agree with him, some say well, this is when Jesus was the ultimate human when he weakened. I don't believe that. I cannot buy that. I cannot accept it, that a man that had given his entire life at the most crucial time of, of his life in the ministry of the world that he could have been weak physically, mentally, or spiritually. You'll never convince me that a, the regular type human being, if you please, went to the cross for me. I can't accept that. Now, that's my opinion. I'm not here to argue with anyone. He wept. He suffered. And Brother Edward suggested in, in his chapter, it wasn't the fear of dying, because he knew he was going to overcome that if he was faithful. He was dying, he was weeping, he was gnashing of teeth. He could look down through the annals of time and see all the many people that would not come to his father through him, that would, if you please, be lost, that would make those decisions of life that would take them away from what could have been theirs. Now this is my opinion, and that was the opinion basically of Brother Edwards in this chapter. He wept drops of blood, be that as it may, but he could see the suffering they were going to endure because they made choices would, that would pull them away of the one that was going to lead them to a better way of life. It's, it comes down to decisions. We have the, the right to choose, but we're expected to choose righteousness over the other. And if we are that kind of people, and hopefully we are, then we are alert to those moments when people give us just a brief moment to inject maybe life-saving words. Sometimes I've responded. There have been those that I've shared with you that I missed. Therein is my judgment. And I want to share something with you I think that's most unique. I told Sheila about this. And I, I don't want, did I read you on the phone? I didn't read this? Okay, this will be new to you too. Uh, I found this in a church bulletin uh, at the Church of Christ when Linda attends and I go with her about a suggested obit column for Jesus. How accurate, we're not going to worry about that, but I thought this was so unique and in closing I want to share this with you. Jesus Christ, 33 of Nazareth, died Friday on Mount Calvary, also known as, known as Golgotha, the place of the skull. Betrayed by the apostle, apostle Judas, Jesus was crucified by the Romans by order of the ruler Pontius Pilate. 
The causes of death were crucifixion, extreme exhaustion, severe torture, loss of blood. Jesus was born in a stable in the city of Bethlehem, Judea. He is survived by his mother Mary, his faithful apostles, numerous disciples, and many other followers. Jesus was self-educated and spent most of his adult life working as a teacher. Jesus was also occasionally worked as a medical doctor, and it, it is reported that he healed many patients. Up until the time of his death, Jesus was teaching and sharing the good news, healing the sick, touching the lonely, feeding the hungry, helping the poor. Jesus was most noted for telling parables about, about his father, a kingdom, and performing a miracle such as feeding over 5,000 people only have five loaves of bread and two fish, and healing a man who was born blind. On the day before his death, he held a last supper celebrating the Passover feast, at which he foretold his death. The body was quickly buried in a stone grave, which was donated by Joseph Arimathea, a loyal friend of the family. By order of Pontius Pilate, the boulder was rolled in front of the tomb. Roman soldiers were put on guard. And this last paragraph is the clincher. As you read so often when we read the obits, in lieu of flowers, the family has requested that everyone try to live as Jesus did. Donations may be sent to anyone in need. May God bless this communion service this morning. With the Holy Spirit with us, with us being reminded of the commitment that we have made to our Savior, would you kneel as best you can while the prayer is read on the bread, please. Keep his commandments. 
in the same spirit of holiness. Would you now bow as, as much as you can while the prayer of the wine is being blessed?
This morning, we have sought the spirit of the living God. We have invited peace by lighting the peace candle. And we once again sought the Holy Spirit to come amongst us. We listen to the word of God and we have taken part in the sacrament of our Lord's Supper by receiving wine and the bread. At this time, we are at the part where we actually can share something with God. So far, we've asked him to share everything with us. But now we can share with God. Let us share with him and let his blessings be great. Please come forward. We confess, Lord, that our hearts are hard and unforgiving at times and even ungiving. We ask for your forgiving flame of transformation through the Holy Spirit. Renew our cold hearts with flames of sacred fire and in that transformation, may we become a generous people willing to transform the world with our offerings to you. I pray this in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Just one moment. I just wanted to mention, I forgot to, that my sister Janice Whitlock is in the Mobile uh, Springham Memorial with a blood clot situation in one of her legs. I didn't got the information late last night, but I'm sure that she would definitely like to be remembered. Janice Whitlock, thank you.
Will you join with me from the bulletin and the reading of the sending forth? We have heard the rush of wind and felt the blaze of Holy Spirit fire. Our hunger has been filled by the bread of life, our thirst quenched by living water. Now let us flow forth from this holy flame encounter filled with the Holy Spirit to share the witness of this moment and God's grace. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 